This is episode 62 of the Fire Protection Podcast, powered by InspectPoint. Today, my guest is Ryan Fogelman of Fire Rover. Uh, Fire Rover is a newer technology. I have never seen this before. I kind of found it on social media. Um, digging through just new technologies must have popped up. Anyway, Fire Rover is working on challenging trash fires, recycling fires, transfer station. You know, when you get a, a bunch of trash or recycling, whatever, there's a lot of things that combust. Um, electronic EVs, uh, lithium ion batteries, you know, Ryan, Ryan's really cool. He's very entrepreneur. Um, it's great to talk to him about obviously the problem of, of these fires within the landfills and what they do there. But obviously fire Rosa has a pretty cool solution to do that. Um, in the past, I had, I had been involved in some of these big dry systems or daily systems with monitors on there. And they weren't a great solution. So obviously there's a problem out there. Uh, trash and recycling is just piling up more and more. And, and those fires uh, get a lot more complicated. So they had a cool product. Uh, yeah, again, Ryan was on uh, chatting about that and just being an entrepreneur himself. So appreciate him coming on and on to the episode. Well, welcome, Ryan, to the Fire Protection Podcast. Uh, uh, I know we we connected recently, and um, I've kind of been following what you guys have been up to over the years. So, uh, um, I guess tell the audience who you are. You know, what gets you up in the morning, and um, kind of your connection to fire. Yeah, that's like two loaded questions, right? I mean, who am I, and how do I? Why do I get up in the morning? So. Um, I get up in the morning. I'm actually a capitalist. I believe that the world is like that the uh, private market will solve the world's problems, even though you have regulation and other things, and it's never that simple, right? I believe that we need to teach people how to drive innovation, to people being, you know, our citizens to drive innovation. And I believe in the entrepreneurial mindset. So, you know, when I say that, I, I don't believe that an entrepreneur, an, an entrepreneur to me solves problems. So the reality is, is that there's a lot of entrepreneurs and you can have entrepreneurs in nonprofit, for-profit, social businesses, that type of thing. But the reason why I'm on this podcast is because in 2015, I, you know, I started working with uh, three guys who had started the Fire Rover um, they basically got a patent on it. And so what we do is we use thermal trending, we use optical flame detectors, we do everything that an AI system does, but we have a patent, a utility patent on the approach of using virtual firefighters. So really what we do is we have human beings who look at every single piece of hay in a haystack to find the needle. When we find those needles, then we can have react. And usually that's 15, 20 minutes before you know any other fire protection is actually uh, moving. Um, you know, so again, we do, we protect a lot of waste recycling, industrial facilities, outdoors, indoors with line of sight. And, uh, you know, we've, we put out a fire every other day, um, going on a fire every day for our over 600, you know, systems that we have across the world. That's crazy. I guess what, why did, uh, um, I guess, how'd you, how'd you, uh, how'd you meet these guys? And then where, where is their, where is where did they, where's their experience from? Obviously they've, they've been in fire protection or fire safety or. Um, actually, no, these guys, uh, had been in the security business for scrap metal facilities. And, you know, oh. one of the, one of the things you learn with scrap metal was that you're really trying to keep people out, you know, right? Like yeah. you're not worried as much about safety. This was, you know, again, this was in sure. 2005 to 2015, but they had built a really good company. And what ended up happening was they were seeing these fires in scrap metal facilities and it was burning down their equipment. Yep. So, you know, one of my good friends from college calls me up. He's like, Fulton, I, you know, get up here. I want to show you something. And and they literally had built a red box, you know, 20 by 8 by 8 container that was like a big squirt gun, as you see it in the video. And uh, that was our first product. And um, we brought it to scrap metal. I mean, you know, the scrap metal guys were pretty happy with it, right? Because, I mean, you know, the last thing you want to do is burn down your entire building. And oh, so yeah. we thought... Yeah. You know, just like anything else, we're like, oh, everyone's going to want this. You're going to blow up overnight. And, you know, just like anything else, it takes, you know, 10 years to build a uh, overnight success. So, you know, that's kind of where we are now. That's cool. Yeah, I, I know, uh, you know, I've, I've been involved over the years in, in some transfer stations and, and ways, mainly on the sprinkler, sprinkler and suppression side. But there's always, and it, it may, you know, 
you may you may have some data. I know you had a, an annual report or something that you, you put out there, but what is um is what is the problem in this? I obviously there's you know, you get these transfer facilities with whatever is being sorted or disposed of and uh, there's fires that happen all the time. Um and it, has it been getting worse or is it like, you know, is there different materials out there that's that's causing more trouble? Yeah, I know. I think I mean, you know, you, you kind of said it, right? It's like there's traditional hazards that have been causing fires for the last 50 years, right? I mean, you know, just inherent in the risk of the occupancy, you know, I mean, you're in waste and recycling, you're getting people throwing away, you know, chemicals and pool chemicals and, you know, hot briquettes and everything stupid that we throw away as the yeah. public, right? And then you have lithium ion batteries, which in 15 really started to hit end of life. And I started, you know, doing the research. So I have a seventh annual waste and recycling facility uh, fire report for the U.S. and Canada. And I've been tracking it since 2016. And really what we're seeing is in 18, we saw a huge spike, right? And I call it, it was the global wave of lithium ion batteries. And then now we've kind of seen it. We've seen it actually spike again. But really the goal for, for me and the waste and recycling industry and Fire Rover is that we have nine of the top 10 waste and recycling companies. There's 10,000 um potential like scrap metal uh murph and transfer stations in the, the us and canada so really the idea is i've never had a catastrophic loss start in an area that we protect right so really the goal is for us to basically get a hold of our lithium ion battery problem in the waste stream by catching these fires early and dealing with them fast and dealing with them with you know the proper way to fight these fires so you know, that's really what's been changing in the U.S. and Canada. We haven't, the reason we like know this, it's it, it hasn't been doing that with the AI systems out there because the AI systems are not working to the level that they need to in these types of very busy occupancies. Sure, sure. What, what do you mean? I know that, AI, that was about AI yeah, what, what's what's what? There's an AI system out there, or is there different? There's, you know, I guess there's what can you explain like what are the different? I only know kind of the fixed fire protection systems right you have a detection method to fire panel you might have a sprinkler system you may have a foam monitor or something like that right it's not it's not a video so is that is there i guess what are the different ways to fight a uh, waste facility fire well yeah and, I, and I, it's a great question right because the reality is of this is that you can use thermal trending right so you can call it ir but basically thermal trending can get you to where you know of a fire the right. issue is, is that it tells you too late what it is. Now, you can catch it early, but you now need to have the technology to understand. We use human beings, look at it and say, hey, you're having a fire. No, you're not having a fire. And then not only do those virtual firefighters will actually, they call the fire department, they do everything they need to do, and then they can spray and put, you know, a, a suppressant or water onto directly onto the fire, usually 15 minutes before any other system would hit. So. Right. The, the the issue is is that a lot of people have bought these these uh, automated systems where it sees a fire and shoots it and that's okay for certain types of occupancies where there's not a lot of movement but when right. you're dealing with waste and recycling you got forklifts and this and you got conveyors and you got all this stuff going on in these these locations again same thing with scrap outdoors you you know you're ripping up you know cars and all the different stuff how do you know what's a normal fire or hotspot versus one that's going to cause an issue. And that's really what we've built our expertise on and working with the firefighters, working with the guys on site to ensure the best outcome. Interesting. So you actually have, uh, I human mean, beings. There's, there's human beings actually monitoring. Yes. So they're not, they're not on yeah. site where or is it like a kind of like a we monitor five, call, call center? Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a central station and, you know, we are there 24 seven, we have butts and seats, you know, like, I mean, obviously if there was a nuclear bomb drop, that's probably the only time you wouldn't be able to not have yeah. someone, you know, behind. And we, we have fixed systems. So like we just did a, did the largest battery recycler in the country with 106 detection zones, 57 cameras, a 250,000 gallon tank and an inductor of an environmentally friendly wedding agent. And basically what all together, this is like the number one fixed system in the world, because the reality is, is that, you know, if you see something, you spray it and it's early detection, it's still a fixed system because it's getting water from the main. 
you know, and it, uh, there's a lot of these hybrid areas where you'll have a location that might have, you know, a ton of conveyors. Well, it makes more sense for sprinkler systems, or you might have bunkers where it might make more sense for Duluth systems. Mm -hmm. But like this, as our skin on top of it can be part of a fixed system, or it can be its own, you know, system based on the back of, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the containers that you see in the back of our, or in yeah. the video. Yeah. 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 So are those, so, so are those containers, uh, hooked to obviously they're hooked to a, a water main but are nope. they're no. self-contained okay, like yeah. that container right there it, it all you need is a concrete pad internet electricity and i can put a mass unit on it and shoot it you know like and basically cover your outdoor hazard so a lot of these scrap metal facilities paper facilities all that stuff i mean that's really i mean it's you know, and again, we've been lucky that we've learned in waste and recycling, but like the reality is, is that we're trying to change the way the world fights fires from the water, water, water approach to early detection and operation yep. by a human, right? Because, yep. I mean, that's really what our patent's around and that's what, you know, differentiates us from anything else on the market. Yeah, no, that makes sense now. So you got, you have, you have water in there. What, uh, what, what type of, uh, I guess probably depends facility and what you're protecting but um well it's always we typically use water if they require it and then there's a product called f500 that's an 18a nfpa um encapsulator agent we use gels we use uh like you know fluoride free foam so i mean it really can use most liquids you know depending on what those look like because i mean everybody says that their product is the best stops all these fires i mean we find that the 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 biggest thing that you're finding is how fast we get to it is how, is why and again we're dealing with crazy fires if you go to our youtube channel i mean we have millions of views on a lot of these events and like from my perspective safety doesn't know competition so right. our customers are allowing us to share these videos because it, this does, doesn't differentiate their business. What differentiates their business is how they process the material. Yep. You know, this is just yep. fire protection. So yeah, no, I, I saw I saw a bunch of the videos. I'm like, man, you're monitoring. You know, your product is also your marketing product because you have all this, you know, you know, security and surveillance on 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 all this live video feed, and you can just take that and put it right into the marketing channel because it kind of it shows it in action, right? It's kind of yeah, and, 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 and there's a little bit there too, but I mean, you know, one of the things like, so, so you have familiarity with, with uh, tip floors, right? And, you know, a lot of times what we see is, is that a loader will go in and dig in and try to lift a fire out and lift it out. Well, eight out of 10 times, that's totally fine, right? There's a yeah. battery that went off and, and it's usually what we're seeing now is about every other fire is a battery fire. So as much wow. as it you know works both ways the way where yeah everyone's dropping these vapes all in our stuff that that's causing an issue but there's still we can't forget that there's all these other hazards like every other one that is still causing all these problems right wow. but like usually the loader goes in and what i try to tell people is that if it's a deep seated fire you can maybe scrape the top of it or you can gently but really what you're supposed to do is pre-wet it let us use our environmentally friendly wetting agents let us use like all the different material stoke it so that now either if it's a battery it can burn itself out but if there's accelerant in which we see i mean a so much accelerant i don't even know what to tell you and i can't even call it anything else other than accelerant because they don't even know what it is when it, when after it burns right like it's not like it, it doesn't leak, like it's burned so you don't know what it is but anyways long story short um that's really like like i always tell people those loaders like if if, if there's a, a fire on a fringe or on the top go grab it but don't go in because you'll see on our youtube channel like yeah. inevitably a loader goes in and it's everywhere and that fire yeah. that was easy is now right i mean you know yeah. that, that, that fire that was a, a simple like well, you just add, you just added yeah. oxygen to it right so uh, you, you <laughs> added oxygen you pushed the accelerant everywhere right. you took any sort of material that wasn't like already getting soaked now you know what i mean like it's just yeah. there's it's like five different things that you're doing so the accelerant are you talking more of the lithium ion battery stuff or is it just no. accelerant in general I'm talking like lithium ion batteries, usually an explosion and a spark. So we actually have optical flame detectors that we use for flash. We use smoke for steam analytics. Like we have all the AI that you could have, but I have a human being who's my last, you know, yeah. my last, you know, so it's not to say like a lot of people think we're automated. 
the, the problem is, and you understand this, right? Like if I look at a sprinkler system, it's 181 degrees or whatever the number is that, you know, for it to pop. Well, the problem that we have is, is that if you're in a tall building with outdoor, like open area and outdoors, usually, I mean, the fire doesn't go straight up. It either goes to the vent or it goes out to the other sides. And then, you know, so what, what ends up happening is that even if that sprinkler is working, it's working like over 20 feet and it's putting out a fire below it, but it doesn't hit the source. Right. And so again this isn't like for us like there was there's a video that we just had where like when the fire department gets there they're working with us because we can still see the fire better than they can right like i know that i'm spraying towards a hot spot where a firefighter or someone spraying you know a hose is really only spraying from the outside they don't know for sure if they're hitting the right thing and again they're doing a good job i'm not questioning this but you know most firefighters they love our system because they can work with us yeah. you know you'll see one, one of our videos you have their their towers literally right next to our nozzle we're putting the fire out and they're basically telling us making sure we're hitting the right spot which we are and then like they'll spray a different nozzle at a different place yeah i mean yeah. it really it really is cool i mean it's not just about finding the fires for our agents it's about actually working and reacting and and you know basically making sure we have a good outcome because just like anything else we're risk mitigation tools so when you were saying waste management and all the other big guys a lot of these guys self-insure so they yep. use us i mean you know we are like you know we have billions and billions and billions of dollars that we protect a property plant equipment but we do it at a price that like even though we do have a cost obviously we do it at a price that's like minuscule compared to what the premiums would be on that same type of risk oh yeah 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 i mean it, it's a uh, it, it it's been a problem i i, I always wondered you know i i designed a few uh, or helped design a few dry systems in some transfer facilities in in new york when i was there and I'm like, how is that sprinkler head going to go off and put that fire out? It just, it was kind of, I guess there was, you guys weren't around at that point, but, um, or maybe there wasn't much around. So, you know, we do get, you know, I've worked with, and there's a lot of fire protection engineers that listen to this podcast. So I think, you know, and maybe they don't know you guys, so it's, uh, but they get brought into a lot of these, um, in these different facilities asking their opinions on, Hey, what what is the best fire protection for 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 waste facilities and you know scrap facilities stuff like that? So well, yeah, and and I mean, we 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 have like six hundred systems more than that in U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, U.K., and France. So like our system's a solution. So you, we, like we can't just sell the equipment somewhere and say, okay, hey, like in Singapore they're going to use this without us, right? I mean, right. It, it really is the full maintenance, the full monitoring, the full like bumper to bumper. And like the reason I say that is that like. Any fire engineer that's interested, we, we've gotten, I, like, you know, one of the fire engineers that I work with, we just received a formal variance in California for a C&D facility, which is construction and demolition, and which is, you know, similar to all, like, the scrap metal facilities, and we got Fire Rover as the primary system. So, I'm getting, a, I have a ton of variances. Um, we're almost FM certified, so, you know, we're down that path, like, 90% of the way done. Um, you know, for our continuous flow solution, which is the fixed system you're talking about. Yep. So, I mean, we really are, you know, you build an overnight success over years, right? We're finally at a point where we've proven what we've done. We have the KPIs to prove what we've done. And now, I mean, I love working with fire engineers, insurance company, you know, guys who are looking to mitigate risk, guys who are looking to do things a little different. Like it's, we were lucky with waste and recycling, but the reality is, is that the world needs to be fighting these fires. The, like, and again, I'm not talking about high rise buildings. I'm not talking about, you know, sprinklers are amazing for your home. Right? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't want to say anything about that, but when you have high ceilings in oh, an yeah. industrial setting Airflow, or outdoors, yeah. yeah then th like this type of system makes sense. Oh yeah. Yeah, totally. What, uh, it, it's funny when, it, when I talk to guests, I'm like all these, all these things pop up in my head as, as we're talking. Um, Please do. So, so what? So this is a fixed. Uh, what standards do you? Um, is it is it kind of a performance based solution, or are you under are you under any any NFPA go, code or guidelines on on the design of these, or is it is it more like performance based design? So it has been traditionally performance base right so our system works as good or better than the alternative system so right. alternative being the sprinkler system that they're typically yep. requiring these facilities that 
I mean, they're just inadequate, right? I mean, um, only in these types of facilities. Again, I'm not saying that that is a blanket statement. So, sure. um, so, so I, I think you know there we have been written into some of the appendixes, and we've had you know I, we actually had a fire rover unit in the construction demolition um, in the fire code that NFPA just put out. So, I mean, there's a lot of guys from you know a lot of the big fire engineers they they will back our stuff and they understand it there's a lot of guys who follow rules and again i get it so now that's why we're getting that FM certification once we nice. get that there's really not much that they could say from our because i mean we meet or exceed all guidelines that would ever have been set up by an insurance company or by a yep. um, you know most jurisdictions nice but yes that, that i've been fighting that fight for 10 years right well, uh, I mean, who, you know. who maintains the the actual units we, when they're in there we do Okay. So that's the thing. Like, so, so we can't, right. I mean, like I have to guarantee that this equipment's going to work. I don't guarantee that I put a fire out because that's why you have insurance. But like, the reality is I guarantee you that the system's going to work when it's needed or we're penalized. Right. But yeah. the reality is, is that like, we maintain it, we monitor, we look at these every day to see if there's a cobweb in front of it, or if your piles yeah. are too high, or, I mean, we're constantly maintaining this remotely and on site anything breaks we come out and again one of the reasons we do a full bumper to bumper warranty the reason we do this is because i don't want my customer to have to do anything so right. the reality is is that when i call them in five years and say hey i need to replace this camera it's full grand and they're like what are you talking about right so that's why like we just have everything tied in and then you know i mean fighting fires is contentious contentious in itself right yeah. i mean like everybody has an opinion on what you could have done different, what you could have done better, what you could have done worse. I mean, what, you know, like usually it's not a, Hey, that was perfect. Right. So, right. you know, I mean, that's where at the end of the day, I mean, our customers trust that, you know, we're their best shot at protecting them from catastrophic losses. Yeah. No, I, I, I've, uh, I got to visit Sims, Sims, uh, recycling out in Northern California at one point. And I'm like, man, this is, this is quite the operation. Um, it was, it was kind of wild what, uh, what they did there and, and, and not only the equipment they had, but even just a, like, you know, it, it, scrap metals still worth money, right? It's still a commodity at that point. So, uh, you want to be pre pre protecting the commodity, right? And trash facilities may be a little different, but, um, you know. Well, and you just said it, right? Like, I mean, that's really funny. I mean, cause it's like the. The reputation of scrap in the country in the public is not a good reputation right but what i try to tell people is that okay like if you look at curbside recycling right so there's like a hundred million tons and again i'm probably getting the numbers wrong but it's like like two-thirds of everything that doesn't go into a landfill and gets reused is steel like or is is metal right about like a, like a 30 per or 25 percent of that is construction and demolition so all that material goes in and like, you know, you hear about these vape problems and all these problems. Well, those are curbside. Well, curbside yes. makes up like less than 10% of all recycling, but it makes up 100% of our minds of what recycling yeah. is, right? Yeah. So I'm like, you know, I put on an article, it's called What's Real Recycling, which is scrap metal, like, you know, everyone thinks they're a nuisance, but they're the real recyclers in the world, right? Like same yeah. thing with, with construction demolition. And then everybody thinks that they, by them putting, you know, like an Apple iPhone into the recycling bin, they're doing a good thing, right? And like, <laughs> this is why we, I mean, the, the public's causing all these fires, right? I mean, that's not, there, there's no, I mean, we cause these fires. We, how many vapes do you just throw into a garbage bin? Right. Right? I mean, it's insane right like you don't even think twice about this stuff you right. throw away lights and all this stuff every day so yeah i mean like like shame on us <laughs> you know I know. I mean? like, yeah so no, i mean that in a good way yeah no speaking speaking of like the the lithium ion batteries is is there and i guess what are you guys doing um and you had that one facility you mentioned uh there's not there's not a great way obviously you can control those fires right now but there has, and I haven't seen one at least, anything to really suppress those fires. Obviously, it's it's severe control, and it depends on the battery size and all and the size of the fire and all that. But what what is what is your thoughts on on lithium ion and and again, there's a lot of being R and D and and stuff being thrown at it right now. But uh, I guess what are you guys doing? 
Well, and I think, I mean, so so we had lithium ion battery thrown at us in 2015. And so I actually just completed a course with uh, like 62 cohorts from across the globe, right? It was called the Battery MBA. Um, and, you know, it's it was interesting because I got to learn the whole value chain, right? Every single thing that we're trying to deal with, not just the end of life that I'm dealing with from a fire perspective, but a lot of the questions, as you can imagine, came down to the end of life because it's the dangers of these, you know, in waste and recycling, we've been dealing with them since 15. In the United States, really the New York Fire Department in the last 24 months has really pushed like the dangers. And by the way, like all the fires in waste and recycling cause two deaths a year about, right? Which I'm not saying that's good, it's unacceptable, but yeah. I mean, the ones that are happening in people's homes are causing, yeah. you know, I think 150 to 200 deaths. It, it's, yeah. it's actually insane, right? Yeah. So so I think the reality with lithium, and again, like there's a ton of guys out there who sell all these materials like that they say will suppress and stop thermal runaway. I don't believe it, right? Number one, you're not stopping thermal runaway. And the reality is, is if you can stop thermal runaway, that's great. It only makes the way that we fight fires better. Yeah, but what we do is we really focus on breaking the chain. So one of the videos you'll see on, on our, our website um, or on the uh, YouTube page, or again, you can link in with me at Ryan Fullman. I have all my stuffs basically on my uh, on my fire safety report that's on LinkedIn. But basically, the uh, like what we do, like you'll see uh, all these drums and pallets, right? And all the drums are filled with all the batteries that, you know, the guys from Lowe's or Home Depot bless them for taking these, right? Because yeah. the reality is we need people to really, you know, be the, the intermediaries. So we see those. So what we do is we spray all the material around it, right? I spray all the collateral assets and I try to let it burn itself out. Even inside that drum as it's lighting basically, you know, fireworks, boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. But you just try to stay on the outside. And we've had a lot of, so we, we do 50 facilities that are battery recycling specifically or electronic recycling. Right. So a lot of those, you don't see as many of those videos because my customers in there don't like to share how they do it sure. because it's still the wild west. But right. the reality is, is that it's always about stopping the chain. It's not about stopping the fire. I'm not saying that somebody else might not say it's about stopping the fire. I'm going to let a battery burn itself out. And that's really what you have to do. The only other thing that I warn is that that white, like when you hear white and hissing coming out, that is not like smoke. That is toxic gas, right? So like I literally, people are fighting these fires and like, Listen, I'm not saying that there isn't a fire extinguisher that can be used for lithium ion batteries that allows you to stand six feet up for a professional in PPE if they know what they're doing. But any human being should not be unprotected standing six feet away from a lithium ion battery fire that we see projectiles come out consistently. Right. right. If you ever see them really tested, they're tested in cages. So that's really, you know, the big thing. It's like it's stop the chain of events and then let it burn itself out and again whether it's massive or one i mean it literally you know it, it doesn't make a difference i mean the bigger it is the more power you got to have yeah yeah it's uh yeah I, I follow the fdny and what they're doing there and it's like uh i think they just come out with something the other day of of, of giving giving bags away the <laughs> that proof and i i don't know how it's going to turn out but uh, did you see this with with FDNY has given out these lithium ion yeah. bags for the the battery. And, yeah, uh, and hey, it's something, but it's just like, it, that's not going to prevent it. it, it it's going to slow it like a little bit, but it's not going to prevent it. So, well, it's the Titanic effect, right? It's like nothing's a problem until there's a major issue and then it becomes something that needs fixed. So I'm not saying those bags don't work. Actually, like call the recycle who has been doing an amazing job for, you know, 15 years collecting batteries actually has a battery drop off with a bag that they claim will not start a fire. Again, wow. I, I never tested it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like so they'll put that in a Hallmark store, or they'll put it in, you know, a battery recycling store and it's supposedly and they 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 allow them to ship in it. So, you know, again, Sometimes, Drew, you know, in fire, like I'm on the uh, hazard material subcommittee, like, you know how those like, you know, the, the laws kind of get made where everybody yeah. throws stuff in and then hopefully someone like, like, maybe there's someone who should like yell about this and scream from the rafters. But like, I don't know enough to do that. You know right, what I mean? Right. But, but I mean, it, it's better than nothing. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, no, the, exactly. The they they is, did something. Yeah. You know? I mean, on airplanes now, you at least have a bag. I hope it works, but you're still getting the toxic fumes, right? Like, that's what, I mean, that's the one thing that I think is, 
you know, again, I, like if, if you want to fight on the front lines, you just got to be protected, right? That's my biggest thing. Like an air raider, you got to make sure you have like the right material. Like, you know, OSHA just changed the rules on, um, you know, fire brigades to emergency response teams. And again, hopefully it brings out the right type of behavior where, you know, we see guys who are on the front lines. If you're going to fight a fire, fight it from 90 feet away right don't fight it from three feet away like they have calf systems that you can use that are you know i mean just like a fire extinguisher that you can spray 90 feet and at least be safe enough that you're not getting hit by shrapnel or projectile or you know something because one person gets killed and this is all you and i will be talking about for the next two years right oh yeah yeah it's 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 kind of nuts that um but it's it's obviously the hottest hottest topic out there and um Nah, it's it's good to you guys. I, I was really intrigued when you obviously reached out, but I've seen you guys around before and I always I always thought of an, an issue with 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 these fires out there. Um no, this has been great, Ryan. Um so a couple uh quick response questions that you, you kinda totally you know, off topic, right? You you did mention you met these these three partners, or are they college buddies of yours? You know, yeah, no. So Brad called me. Brad was, uh, I went to high school with him and then I went to college okay. with him. He was a fraternity brother. And, oh, no you know, I'm 40, I'm 48 years old. So at 40, I decided to only work with people that I trusted. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, like at least the people that you trust, you know, like you know what they're going to do to you, where, you know, the other guys, I, I just didn't, you know, I had a couple of like not great experiences. So, I, I worked on three companies. One was Cohatch with uh, my partners that I've known for a long time. Uh, one was a product called Stick Grip for hockey sticks. And that was with a, one of my fraternity brothers. And then Brad called me and I was like, yeah, you know, so, I mean, I came up, listen, I've loved it. I mean, Brad unfortunately passed away in 2019. So, you know, we've really, I mean, he didn't get to see the, yeah. you know, 2020 was probably the year that we really started, you know, like, you know, getting this out. And, sure. you know, I, I still think, you know, I, I mean, I think if you look at waste and recycling, we were lucky that we were able to cut our teeth in waste and recycling because there's very little regulation. And most, you know, like you said, most sprinkler contractors or most jurisdictions have kind of like, it's like a necessary evil. Like they've thrown their hands up from a fire protection and they're just okay with, you know, having 15 to 20 major catastrophic losses a year. So yeah. like, I, I believe our solution is actually made for hangers, right? Like, I mean, if you think about like the the 30,000 deluge, the 409 was just changed to, to allow for a targeted deluge system. Ours is like perfect. I can fog spray it onto like fuel if I have to, I can straight stream it into certain spots. I'm not hitting anything on the aircraft that is, you know, valuable on, unless it's on fire, obviously. So like, I think that the the real excitement for me is not waste of recycling. I, yeah, I love them. I think they're great. But, I, you know, and again, I think we can, you know, it's it's pretty clear. To, you know, you can solve your problem by great best practices, educating the public as well as we can, and, you know, technology, right? So yeah. how can we now do this in hangars and refineries and all the other high hazard stuff that's going on in the world with, with an early detection and a, a targeted solution, not, you know, with humans, right? And yeah. again... The one thing I was saying to you before, it's not always about hitting the target. It's about collateral assets. It's about not hitting certain things. So that's where a lot of these AI systems fall down or automated systems fall down as well. Yeah, I, I know 409, mm -hmm. semi-decent, you know, did a, did a lot of those obviously fixed design or, or helping them and uh, even on the industrial side. So there's obviously challenges there and there's been some changes there too, right? Uh, with 409 over the years, and especially with foam. With that, you know, everything going on with foam. Um, but uh, now I, I asked you that question about college. It's like, because, you know, I I worked for some pretty big fire protection companies and then uh, did this startup with Inspect Point with, with one of my fraternity brothers. And uh, he's CEO and I'm, I'm, I'm here with him. And it's kind of funny. Uh, you, you go back to the roots and. And, and kind of create a company from there. It's kind of, you know, a lot of, obviously a lot of trust and, um, yeah, it's, it, it's interesting to hear that story. So that's why I brought it up. Well, and, and it, it is, I mean, so that one of the other companies that, that we built at the same time was Cohatch. And I mean, we basically go to walkable neighborhoods. Um, and we, I mean, we have 600, um, like 200 boost scholarships and 400, um, 
you know, give scholarships. So really it's all startups. It's nonprofit and for-profit startups because honestly, a nonprofit startup has the same issue that a for-profit does. Um, but I mean, yeah, we, we, we've like, I mean, so literally my passion every day is trying to help people at least give them the resources within their reach. They might have to go out and get it. I mean, we've 8,000 members that they can work with, but we've seen so much success over the last 10 years in that type of, uh, you know, basically show and tell type of culture model. Um, that it's, you know, it's done really well. Um, but, um, you know, and again, so I, I'll talk startups all day long. I mean, this has been, you know, very, it's been a self-funded labor of love, family owned business that, you know, is, um, you know, we still have the same owners that we had pretty much since 15 and, and it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's amazing, right? Fun. The real innovation yeah. can come out of people who had no idea what fire was. I just yeah. wrote an article. I'm like, I, I didn't know I anything about fiber until 2015 besides lighting a campfire. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, that's it's, funny. It's funny you say that. Yeah. I, I was the fire person. And then the three other co-founders of ours is where they had no idea what fire was. Right. Now, now, uh, all of them are like, yeah, they're probably one of the, uh, they're experts in fire protection. Kind of. Well, and that's no, where, great. I mean, literally it, it takes, you know, I mean, what, what did people do? Like I, I follow a lot of American history or it's like my favorite thing, but you know, and you apprenticed, you learned, you ask questions, you talk yeah. to people, you, I mean, and that's where I say the entrepreneurial mindset is really, how do I have a problem or obstacle that's in front of me and go over it without getting stymied in the fact that like, I can't figure out a solution, right? It's, it's tactical a little bit. Sometimes you just got to like, wake up every morning, do something that moves the needle even if you don't know if it works in that vision right. and you're like okay i gotta do something today i gotta do something like it's yeah. you know it's so to me that entrepreneurial mindset works in everything you're really just trying to make everything better and you're never you know you're never satisfied with the status quo yeah no it, it creates new ideas and solutions to problems that you know that we have so um ryan where can we find you where can where can people listening in or, or watching uh find fire rover yourself and and any any more info yeah and linkedin is probably the best i have a fire safety report that has uh i'm, I'm about to hit ten thousand members that opt in and you know so that's one i have a ton of articles that i write for waste 360 and for um the american uh fire journal um so american fire safety journal it used to be like it, they just opened the america's version but yeah i mean I, I i i write articles when i see i have one coming out on uh best practices for uh high bay and canopy structures uh, you know and that was written with a fire engineer named uh, andy lynch um so uh, i know andy. You know, I, yeah yeah you know andy yeah he was on he was on this uh podcast like early on talking about his uh his uh ar technology he had an ar technology yeah, yeah he yeah. still has it he's still working on it and again so you know i work with fire engineers that you know believe in some innovation and again it's right. like half right like you know some guys are just like you know i mean we had a blimp that 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 a uh a fire um, marshal in uh, roswell new mexico wouldn't allow us to Get around the 409 code based on the fact that there was a blimp inside this hangar that had no it only had a battery right it, there was no nothing else was dangerous but it was like i need the thirty thousand gallon deluge system so oh you know gosh. again you know I, I i'm not saying that we should all just like throw all the rule books out but i mean there is a you know innovation in fire is very difficult and i'll tell you yes. You know, every person that I talk to said, if you ever get FM certified in the next 20 years, you know, and like we're on 10 years, we've been written into so, and Andy, he sits for all of our NFPA. So like, I mean, he really is a uh, a big part of what we're doing. And, you know, Not listen, cool. any, any fire engineer, any fire company that wants to, you know, have a new solution, I'm happy to work with them and, you know, get them integrated. And again, I'm not competing with a uh, fire sprinkler, right? Yeah, I'm actually saying, hey, we'll just take over this little piece of where it works and you do everything else, right? So yeah, you know, there's no business to really lose, but I think a lot of people see our system and they like, it's not a replacement unless the building's small enough to be a replacement. Yeah, you still need them in the building, right? Well, uh, you still need them in the building. It just enhances everything else, right? Hundred percent. I mean, if you if you're doing, you know, a ten thousand square foot building that's open, no, you don't need it, right? Or right. you know, or, but if you're doing, you know, uh, like a typical building with equipment and other things, I mean, yeah, the, you need a you need the best fire protection in every zone. And I mean, 
through, you understand that, right? Like you got to say, okay, like how many times have you looked? You're like, I don't know how we should handle this. Yeah. And, you know, you put your heads together and you figure it out. So, you know, right. we're just a tool. No, it's great. Uh, can't wait to learn more. Hopefully uh, see that FM approval sometime soon. Right. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get this out and uh, appreciate you coming on the podcast again. No, and I appreciate it. And I'll let uh, Andy know that uh, that yeah, Drew, right. you know, was really <laughs> excited. You know, I, give me a ask you, I, yeah. like we got to make sure this does better than his, right? So, I mean, you know, how many how many uh, watches did he get? I don't know, probably a few thousand. Uh, it was uh, early on, well. so um, it was, I, I should I should catch up with him because there was some really cool technology that he was working on. So. Well, yeah, and then he's the one who designed, you know, the facility and the, the recycling facility. So, I mean, you know, again, we have a bunch of different fire engineers that work with us, but Andy knows our system the best out of anyone in the world. So I would say um, having him on would, you know, again, I, I wouldn't, he's always up to, he has his hands in a lot of different pots, right? Oh, so he, I'm sure yeah. he's very interesting, but I'm sure, you know, he'll have to give us some insight. Yeah. But I'm, I'm happy to join you anytime. I mean, just cool. let me know. Thanks again, Ryan. Cool. Thanks, Drew. All right. Yes, yeah. All right. This has been episode 62 of the Fire Protection Podcast, powered by Inspect Point. I want to thank Ryan Fogelman from Fire Rover coming on, uh, talking about this kind of niche inside of the niche in fire protection for landfill, trash, recycling facility fires, and, and what they're doing and, and what the challenges are still there. So um, really cool to talk about this technology and get the knowledge out to the masses. So thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again soon. Take care.